Hello! I'd like to welcome you to Insects, the Good, the Bad, and Maybe the Ugly. I'm Amy Hahn, and in the second half, you'll meet Kathy Carpenter. We're both Knox County Master Gardeners, and we really enjoy learning about what's in our gardens and how to take better care of them. In the next few minutes, we'll go over a few interesting bug facts, help you identify bugs that you see in your garden now, know when to take action, recognize several common good bugs and their benefits, know some really common look-alike bugs, and have some useful resources to help you as you're taking care of your gardens. Did you know that of the over a million species of insects in the world, 97% of them are good or neutral to your homes and your gardens? As a gardener, being out in the garden and expecting our plants in a process called scouting can help us find insect pests before they become a major problem. This Armenian cucumber has a few holes in it, and I did see some leaf-footed bugs on it the other day. But today I'm not finding any, even underneath. The broccoli plant is a different story. I found an egg mass, which goes in some water with a little bit of soap in it. Here's a squash plant and a squash bug, and it goes in the bucket too. Another key is identification. We don't have to search the books like Evan did here, but we will show you some good tools. Also, plants are not passive. Most of them aren't quite as active as this Venus flytrap here. As gardeners, we should be aware that some Varieties of plants are more attractive to insect pests than others. And when attacked, many plants give off chemical signals that attract beneficial insects to come to their rescue. We're going to call this the tincture of time. On June 20th, the stems of this Asian long bean were completely covered by aphids being guarded by ants. With no intervention from me, by June 26th, all we're seeing is white aphid sheds and some confused ants looking for their herd of aphids to milk. I can only assume that a ladybug or a lacewing larva had a feast. One final note here is that pesticides can harm good bugs also. Most pesticides on the market today are broad spectrum, but if you can use something selective that only works on a particular type of insect, that's the best route to go. So now, let's look at some of the most common insects you will find in your garden. Some of the bad guys are the beetles, the caterpillars, and the sapsuckers. The most common beetles you might be seeing in your garden are the cucumber beetles, both striped and spotted, the Mexican bean beetles, and milkweed beetles. If you notice, all of these have the name of the plant they're most commonly found on in their name. That is also true of the caterpillars. Here we have a tomato hornworm and a squash vine borer. The tomato hornworm attacks all the things in the tomato family, which can be confusing since the tobacco hornworm, a very similar worm, is often found on tomatoes. Then we have the sap suckers. These insects have small mouth parts that poke into the stems and leaves of your plants and suck the juices out. One of the worst ones around here is the brown marmiated stink bug, which was brought into the country in the 1990s and has spread throughout. 
When it was first here, it was much more of a problem than it is now. Then you have the harlequin bugs and the squash bugs. The last sapsucker I'm going to mention is the aphids. They come in a multitude of colors with each different type attacking a different type of plant. One good thing about the aphids is everything likes to eat them. They are like the chickens of the insect world. So now let's look at the good guys. We have the predators, the parasitoids, the pollinators, decomposers, and free agents. The best known of the predators are the ladybugs, with the adult eating some aphids, but the larval stage being the more voracious predator. Then we have the surfid flies, which as adults are very effective pollinators, and in the larval stage eat nearly as many aphids as the ladybug larva. The assassin bugs are ones we rarely see, but they're aggressive predators in the garden. A word of caution with these, if you do see one, don't attempt to pick it up, as their poking mouth parts can cause a nasty sting for us too. The predatory stink bugs are also hunters, and will hunt down and suck the juices out of pressed insects. All three of these types I've seen in my garden. The parasitoids are some of the most interesting of the beneficial insects. Like the predators on Alien, they lay their eggs on or inside the pest insect. Their larvae eat the insect from the inside out, and you end up with wasps popping out of swollen aphids and baconid wasp larva making cocoons on the outsides of the cabbage hornworms. Another important group of beneficial insects are the pollinators. The bees, the moths and butterflies, the hummingbirds, the lightning bugs, they all work to move pollen from one flower to another and ensure the fruit and vegetables we're wanting. Decomposers also have their place in the story. The pill bugs and the beetles, even the maggots and the earwigs are insects that benefit our gardens. We also have some other creatures that help us in our garden and I'm going to call those the free agents. They're the birds, the amphibians, salamanders, and frogs. You also have lizards, and even the praying mantis. Now that we've talked about the most common insects in your garden, let's spend a moment discussing taking action. The first action you want to take is called scouting. You want to be out in your garden, making sure you're looking at your plants. You want to look at them close up and even a little bit further away. And here, these pepper plants have some holes on them. You want to look at the underside of the leaves and inside the plants to make sure and find a pest if it's there. Here, I'm not finding any pests. So I'm standing back to look at the overall health of the plant and how much damage there is. Now you've been scouting. You've found some damage and maybe you've even found a bug. So the next step is to identify it. If your bug is one of these, it is a pest insect and can cause damage if the populations get high enough. The other thing about these hard-bodied insects, the squash bugs, the stink bugs, and the Japanese beetles, is in the adult form, they're very resistant to pesticides. 
A bucket of soapy water is a good remedy for these pesticide-resistant insects. The stink bugs, squash bugs, even the slugs, though you might want to have gloves for those. And the hornworms, which, if you purchase a UV flashlight, and they're readily available in the pet section to help you find pet accidents, they actually glow in the UV light, making them very easy to find in the evenings. Another thing for those stink bugs and the harlequin beetles and the squash bugs is they will lay their eggs on the undersides of the leaves. And you can find the egg clusters and remove them. I find the duct tape wrapped around my hand sticky side out is a very easy way of doing that. Also, don't forget about the tincture of thyme. Your plants will be trying to call beneficial insects to help them. And particularly with insect pests like aphids, thyme is an effective tool. If you're seeing a lot of damage to your plant and have identified the pest as one of the ones listed in this Home Vegetable Garden Insect Control Guide, you can choose to use a chemical pesticide. Just be sure to read the instructions and follow them, taking special attention to the instructions on the label, as some pesticides, whether they're chemical or whether they're synthetic or organic, can harm your plant if used incorrectly. It is always preferable to use a selective pesticide in instances when they will work. For pests like the cabbage worms and the tomato hornworms, there is an effective product called Bacillus thuringiensis, and it's a variety that's commonly called K that is specific for caterpillars, butterfly and moth caterpillars. Now you wouldn't want to get this product on your milkweed as it will kill those caterpillars also. So you want to apply any product that you apply specifically to the plants that are affected by the pest you're targeting. Another very useful BT product is BTI that can be put in water and it will prevent mosquito larvae from hatching into adults. It's also effective for fungus gnats. At the beginning of this talk, I mentioned broad spectrum pesticides, and they have a place for occasional use when damage is getting excessive and the pest doesn't seem to be controlled by other methods. Be sure to refer to the pest control guide or the labels on any pesticide products you're considering using before you use them. The biggest key to taking action is catching problems early. And you do that by scouting, by being out in your garden regularly. That way you will notice damage when it first occurs. Then you can identify any bugs that you find and look in references specific for that pest insect to know what action to take, though oftentimes no action is the best. Now that I've covered some bug facts, the most common bugs you'll find in your garden and when to take action, I'm turning it over to Kathy for part two. Hi, this is Kathy and I'm going to take you through the second part of the presentation. In this part, we're going to focus on how to actually identify a bug that you may see in the garden. First of all, I would like to make sure that you all realize that there is a handout that's included with this uh, talk. As part of that handout, we have included resources for you to use. Okay, bug identification, the first steps. There are seven questions that we want to find answers to. When you go out to scout, you might want to go old school and take paper and pencil with you. I would recommend this for two reasons. One, you don't have to rely on your memory. 
and number two, especially if you see more than one unidentified bug. You could, of course, in this day and age, take your smartphone and take pictures, which would be a great idea, or um, do both. But I would also recommend that you take a magnifying glass with you. Okay, the questions. Number one, where did you find it? This refers not only to where uh, on the plant, but we even want to know where in the garden did you find it on the perimeter or did you find it in the central part of your garden? In addition, what kind of plant are we talking about? And specifically, where on that plant? Did you find it on the top of the leaf or the underside of it? Did you find it on the stem or did you find it on the stalk? Did you find it on the spine of the leaf? Be as specific as you can. When did you see it? Of course, you need to know the time of day um, but we also want to know the season and even the month. Aphids are a good example of this. Aphids become more active as the temperature climbs. However, they do their most damage in late spring before the temps get really warm. Third question, does your unidentified bug have wings? Not all adult um, insects do but specifically the immature forms certainly do not. Fourth question, does it have antennae? All arthropods, all insects will have antennae as adults. But again, the immature forms, the nymphs, the larva, the pupa will not. Number five, what color or colors do you notice on the bug? Both on up on the top and on the bottom if that's possible to see. Number six, what is the size of the unidentified bug? On the average, the adult bug is about one eighth to three quarters of an inch long. Remember that's an average. A dime in diameter is about three quarters of an inch. So that can give you um, a reference point when trying to decide what size is this. And lastly, what shape is it? Is it, is it round? Does it have a narrow waist? What shape is it? Once you have the answers to your questions, again, you can go old school for your answers. You can go to hard copy resources. These are a couple of books that we've used. There are also posters that you can use to identify your bug. But in this day and age, most people go electronic technology. I do want to say one word about the smartphone. There are insect identification apps that you can download. Many of these have a trial period, and that trial period can be defined as a length, as a number of days, or the number of times it's used. After that point, they may want to charge you a subscription fee. So I would suggest that you read the reviews from other users uh, before you download a, an ID app for insects. One I can recommend is iNaturalist. This is a citizen scientist crowdsourced application that a ranger did recommend at a, uh, when I was at a talk. A third resource is uh, the Soil, Plant, and Pest Center. This is in Nashville, Tennessee, and there are two ways that you can use this resource. You can go to their website where you will find a form that you can download and instructions on how to send in a sample bug. Um, unfortunately, there is a fee attached to that, and it is $15 according to their website. Or if you use Facebook, you can follow, as seen in this uh, slide, follow the Soil, Plant, and Pest Center on Facebook and send them a message where you can include a picture and your question. Try to be as specific in your message as possible. But Google is your superpower and everybody uses Google and Google is especially helpful when we're trying to identify a bug.
So here's our first example. This person went out to scout in their garden and saw the damage on these leaves. The person had the smartphone with them, so they entered a rather broad description, spots on leaves. And if you've used Google, you've noticed that you've got choices, all images, shopping, news, and there are other choices. Right now, this is set to all. So if she hit click um, on at this point, she would go to informational articles. But she does change it to images, and you see on the screen what that pulls up for her. She reviews the images, and on, as you can see on the right, she finds an image that is very similar to the damage that she sees on her plants. On the left side, you see that the image that she selected, tiny black dots on mint leaves. She clicks on that, and on the right, you see that it brings her up to the National Gardening Association that has a forum. So she enters her questions and informations um, into that forum, and in about a day, she gets an answer, and that answer is a four-lined plant bug. Now, this person has included a link, and you'll notice that link, it's for the University of Minnesota, and it has .edu at the end of it, and we're going to talk more about that later. So she clicks on that link. And what she sees are pictures of the four-line plant bug nymph and the damage that it, it causes. Since it looks so similar to her damage, she wants more information, clicks on the article, and looks at the quick facts. And the quick facts verify that this four-lined plant nymph is most likely the source of her damage and she wants further information. So she goes back to Google, enters the scientific name. This time she's marked all so that she will get the articles rather than pictures. Pulls up the articles and clicks on the first one, four-lined plant bug, that um, takes her to this article from the University of Florida and gets all of the information that she wants about this pest. A review of the questions, where, when, wings, antennae, colors, size, and shape. But we've also added for you some terms to use when you're doing a Google search for your identification of an unidentified bug. The color, the type, the size, the shape, and the plant that is found on. The uh, type is the only one of our seven questions that's not covered. So under type, are we talking about, these are just general ideas, a beetle, maybe it's a nymph or a larva. Is it a worm, is it a caterpillar? The point being, for your identification, you want to be as specific as possible. As I noted earlier, adding .edu or .ext, to the end of your search will take you to uh, a source that will give you much more reliable information. This is the first exercise that we're going to go through step by step. On the right are just the general um, search terms that we've suggested for you as a reminder, but you're scouting through the garden and this is what you see on the right doesn't have any um, antennae, doesn't have any wings, so chances are real good we're not looking at an adult. Notice the colors, the shape. So we're going to do a Google search and we try to be as specific as possible. We've entered black with spots, six legs, long body, rounded abdominal tip, the screen shows that we want images. We review those images, hoping that we're going to see an image that's much like uh, what we noted in the garden, and sure enough, we do, down in the lower right-hand corner. 
So we click on that and it takes us to this screen. The screen gives you several pieces of information where the red arrow points is the article that had this picture in it. Underneath that shows looks like. Underneath that, similar images if we want to take uh, a look at different angles of the unidentified bug. And down across the bottom are all the images that were in the previous screen. But since this picture looks like the one that we saw in our garden, we're going to click on the article. Lady, ladybug, lady beetle facts from nature mapping uh, foundation.org. And it takes us to this article. We like what we read, but we want to know more. So we go back to the Google search. And I'm going to put in some general information terms, but I'm going to put EXT on the end. This time I put in ladybuginformation.ext. I've made sure that I'm on all. I hit search. It brings me up some articles. I want more information, so I'm going to try to change up my uh, search terms. And I try ladybird beetle facts dot extension and I get more articles. Now this is an exercise that you can do at home. So if you want to try this, um, you can hit pause on the recording now because the next slide that I show you is going to give you the answer. Hopefully your search took you to the cabbage looper. All right, so we've looked at how to figure out what is this bug that I don't know what it is. But what if I see two bugs and they look so much alike? Or what if I don't even know what the bug looks like to begin with? How do I know if it's a good bug or a bad bug? You do the same Google steps that we just went through, which I did, and it brought me to this screen. The nice thing about this image is that it shows you two places to look on these look-alikes that might help you tell them apart. On the left is the brown marmorated stink bug and I can tell that by the little uh, yellowed to white areas in between the brown, brown black triangles. I also look at the shoulders and on the right I see a spined soldier bug. So I now know that the brown marmorated stink bug is the bad bug. I want to take action against it. The spine soldier bug, I want to leave alone because he's a predator. The bottom line here is if you don't identify a bug or haven't been able to identify a bug or don't know what it is when you first look at it, leave it alone until you do know what it is. Now these two are look-alikes, but they're both good bugs. At the bottom on the left, you have the larva of the firefly. And on the right bottom, you have the larva of the soldier beetle. As Amy told you, with most good bugs, it's the larva that are the most predaceous, and that's true for both of these. The firefly larva loves to eat snails and slugs and worms. The soldier beetle larva goes underground and takes care of eggs and larva, whether they're good or bad, um, that it finds under the soil. Now the difference between the two adults, the firefly and the soldier beetle, is that the soldier beetle can also be a predator. It will eat aphids but both of these adults are pollinators. They both like to sip on um, nectar and eat pollen. So in summary, let biology work for you. Be patient. Always remember that chemical, chemical control is not your first go-to. 
and that all organic pesticides are still chemicals. If you do have to use chemicals, try to be as selective for that bug as possible. Amy talked to you about BT products. She also talked to you about the non-selective chemicals, the horticultural and insecticidal soaps, the neem oil, and spinosad. This is just a reminder of the seven questions you want to have the answers to before you do your Google search. These are terms you want to make your Google search as specific as possible. You want to try to remember to add .ext or .edu to the end of your search term to try to get to the most reliable information that you can. And in conclusion, we hope that you learn and remember some of the bug factoids that you were told. In particular, remember that 97% of those insects are good or neutral. It's only 1% to 3% that you have to worry about. Hopefully, we've given you some tools to be able to identify the good bugs and the bad bugs in your garden, to recognize the benefits of the good bugs, and to know when you need to take action and what to do against the bad bugs. We've given you a couple of the common lookalikes, and we also have given you some useful resources that we have listed for you on the last page of your handout. We both want to thank you for um, joining us, and we hope that you have found this very useful. Thank you for watching this presentation of Insects, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. You can find the handout at the Knox County Master Gardener website, knoxcountymastergardener.org, under the calendar listing for this talk for August 1st, 2020. Thank you and happy gardening. We hope you enjoyed this presentation and that you learned something that will help you in your gardening endeavors. Whether that means more blooms on your flowers and ornamental shrubs, attracting more pollinators to your garden, or improving your vegetable production. As we were not able to field your questions today, we want to close by offering you some ways to reach us. As you can see on this slide, we have a presence on Facebook. You may post questions to either of these Facebook pages. Feel free to upload a photo, especially if it helps to describe the problem you have. If you are not a Facebook user, you may call the Extension Office at 865-215-2340 and leave a detailed message with your question. Your question will be forwarded to a Master Gardener to research and respond to you. You may also send an email to Rylan Thompson, the Knox County Extension agent who advises the local Master Gardener program. If a photo would help to describe the problem, feel free to attach one or two. Try to keep the total attachments to less than five megabytes. You may get a response directly from Rylan, or he may route your question to a Master Gardener to research and respond to you. We are eager to return to public presentations. In the meantime, you can watch any of our recorded presentations by going to our website, finding a Speakers Bureau event on the calendar, and clicking on the link that is included within the event details. Now, let's go get some dirt under our fingernails. <laughs>